All right. Good afternoon, everybody. It's very nice for me to be here at my first Postgres conference. Um, I don't know. I'm sure if for a few of us it's the first time. <coughs> Looking at my title today, I realized that it's a bunch of goldigook uh, with so many words that a lot of people might just not care about. So thank you for coming nonetheless. Um, I'll be talking about full text queries, which is maybe the only part of what you see on screen that you'll find in the Postgres documentation, and the rest I will give plenty of background on. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, translate.org.za that uh, sponsored the work that I'm uh, presenting today and Tangent Solutions, my current employer, for sponsoring my time today. A little bit about me. I uh, won't consider myself a DBA or some kind of Postgres fundi, but uh, I am a Python developer and language technology is my passion. So solving problems with human languages, working with text data, that kind of thing. <coughs> Um, in an earlier part of my career, I did extensive work in the field of software localization that is about adapting software to a new language or culture or country, um, and that often involves translation of user interfaces. Um, and that's not uh, just for background. The product I'm talking about today is part of that sort of ecosystem of translation tools. All right, so what is a translation memory that I mentioned in the title? A translation memory can be thought of as a collection of texts and, they, and their translations. Simply, you can think of it as a simple two-column table with one column being English text and another column being the translation for each row. Maybe a paragraph and its translation, or a sentence and its translation, that kind of thing. It's not meant as a database to store the translations of a product that's used to generate the translated website or the translated newsletter or anything like that. It's meant for reuse for, transla for translators. So usually incorporated into translation tools directly so that when you're translating something new, you'd be getting suggestions from previous translation work to help you improve your speed and maybe improve your consistency while translating so that you can see how a certain translation problem was solved in the past. So you might immediately think of simply looking up an old translation exactly the way you're translating it now and maybe you'll find a translation for it. But the more interesting case is fuzzy matching where you want to find some kind of translation, even if it's not quite what you're doing now, but it's close enough. Maybe you're currently translating just that snippet, upload a file. Maybe it isn't in the database, but you are interested in a translation of download a file because maybe you can only edit that translation in whatever language you're translating into minimally or maybe even nothing at all and save quite a bit of time. This is usually incorporated into translation tools and if I'm reading what I have to translate, if it's short, I might want to start and type in my translation within milliseconds, maybe half a second or whatever. So if I'm going to get a suggestion that's, that's supposed to help me, it must be there pretty quickly. I can't wait a second or two for it. It do doesn't really help because by that time I've already started translating from scratch, sentence by sentence, for, exa for example. So I'm talking today about a specific translation memory system. It's called Amagama. It's a product, I was one of the developers many years ago. Um, it's, not, it's an open source project. Uh, the URL is on GitHub, I'll show it later. It's implemented in Python on the Flask micro framework and uses Postgres extensively. Um, it's a pretty simple project. It's a web service where people can query and say, this is what I'm currently translating. I'm translating from English into German. Do you have any relevant suggestions? And it responds, all right? That's basically all it does. It has a simple web user interface, but that's not the primary means that we consider people, you know, most likely to use it through. Uh, but you can test it that way if you're interested. We also have a hosted instance where we have a database containing the translations of a lot of free and open source software that are end user oriented and translated into lots of languages. Things like GNOME, KDE, LibreOffice, a lot of Mozilla products, uh, VLC, DuxPaint, uh, a lot of the Postgres tools, you know, all of their error messages, a lot of those are translated into lots of languages. Where that is in the database. Uh, it's something like 20 odd projects that we import their translations into many languages um, so that people can query and get these results so that 
we really, it's just uh, to benefit open source translators the world over. Our deployment, this one I'm talking about, is read-only. Um, and that will become a little bit relevant later on. Um, so in principle, you, in a translation memory, you want to, want to say, I translated something new, add this so that I can get more suggestions later on. But ours is read-only. So we import like a new set of data from time to time, but it's read-only. So the users don't have any ability to change anything. And we're not changing it frequently at all. Our hosted instance is at Oregon State University Open Source Labs. They host a lot of infrastructure for open source projects, things like download, mirrors, VMs, and Postgres servers, which is what we use. So we've got a tiny virtual machine and a shared Postgres server. All right, so it's a multi-tenant system. We're sharing it with bug trackers of some open source software, and frankly, I don't even know what else. Um, I don't mention that to be funny. Uh, that's going to be slightly relevant in how I solved some of my problems. Our annual budget is absolutely nothing, um, which might explain why things like adding RAM wasn't part of the solutions to the problem. Um, that's not quite true because we have a domain registered, but um, otherwise there's absolutely no expenses. And uh, this web API is open for anybody to use. It can be integrated into tools. There's no auth. Um, it's integrated into a number of translation tools. I worked on two of them, um, and we're hoping that this is helping to promote multilingualism amongst the open source software. All right, so getting down to the Postgres side, th we're talking about a very simple product. Um, there's only really one query, uh, and I'll explain that in detail. There is another one, but it's irrelevant for this talk. Um, and it has two tables per source language. So in our hosted instance, we only use English as a source language, so it only has these two tables. And this is the whole schema. There's nothing more to it. All right, so there's an identifier for the source text. That's a language translating from. There's the text itself. There's the vector field. Can I just see by raise of hand, who knows a little bit about text search functionality in Postgres, the TS vector type? All right, so that's a type in Postgres, built in type that assists you in doing full text queries, doing the ranking based on results and things like that. I won't go into a whole lot of detail. I'll rather try to present on what I think is maybe novel in what I did. But so that column helps in performing the full text abilities of our to do be able to do such queries. The length is the length of the text field. That's unnecessary, of course. I could have done that, that through a function. Uh, but I'll talk a bit, I'll talk in detail later about the length. And you can see that there's an index on that vector column that's implementing the full text searching so that we can s look up uh, fuzzy matches, not just exact matches. All right, and you'll see it's of the gen index type. So it's not the B tree indexes, uh, index type because the B tree index can't index multi value uh, entries like arrays or TS vectors. The targets is the big table that uh, contains all of the translations that's not the source language. So it's 10 times bigger in our case. It has a foreign key. It has the text that's th in the translated language and a language code so that I would know a translation into what language it was. I know this sounds maybe uh, like a lot of nitty gritty detail, but I'm going to talk about almost all of these fields at some stage and this is all there is to it. So I hope you, you'll allow me this bit. The index there is so that I can look up fast in the way that it's used. And if you'll allow me, I'm now going to quickly run through the way that the query works. As I say, there's just one query. If I were to do an exact lookup, I would look for that exact text that I'm translating now in English in the text field. I'll get the identifier and look it up here in the language I'm interested in. In the general case, I'm using the full text search, the vector field, to get similar rows in other words, it's not, they're not exactly the same. I'm filtering by length so that I get things that are of more or, length, more or less the same length as my query. And then I look up all of those IDs and I look them up. Sorry, I retrieve all of those IDs and I do a lookup in the targets table for that language. Maybe they're there, maybe they're not there. All right. If anybody wants to clear up something, maybe now is not a bad time. Anything up to now, feel free to raise your hand. We can clear something up. Not all of the details are important, but I'll be continuing a bit on this line. Just so you know more or less what I'm talking about, this is not a gigantic database. I'm sure all of you in this room work with bigger databases than this. This is not even three gigabytes. 
Um, the source is table, just the English text in our case, 200 megabytes, and you can see I indicated the size of the heap, the, the row data separately from the index, um, because for me it was interesting uh, to see how long it would take, for example, to read the whole index into memory, or full text scans, or uh, uh, full table scans are not necessary, um, but it gives a bit of a, an idea, um, as Hans Jurgen mentioned in the keynote this morning, you know, can you expect the whole thing to be cached? Now, of course, I'm sure most of you work in systems where you can expect three gigabytes to be cached, but this is where I get back to my introduction. I'm on a shared Postgres server, I can't. And most of the targets table is never used, all right? We've got things there in obscure languages that you've never heard of, most likely. Some of them will literally never be retrieved or very likely never be retrieved. I can't expect my kind free hosting to keep all of that cached for me, and it's not happening anyway, and I don't even have access to that server for tuning. All right, so I'm going to be hitting disk from time to time, so it's, you can just imagine that we're in 10 years ago, maybe. Then maybe this was a big database, sort of, for some people. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the performance. You know, this is a case study, what I did to improve performance. The performance as it's perceived from the client, as I said, the client would like nice performance. There's obviously DNS lookup first. That's once off, we can ignore that. Then there's the high level connection. Some of it might be reused depending on the web server. Then there's the request and the final response. They're pretty small. Often people will ask for queries and there'll be no results because we don't have anything relevant. So even the responses are often very small. The interesting part is in the processing. That's obviously the part I'm in charge of. But if we want a nice responsive service, maybe we can aim for something like half a second, but ideally we'd want something faster. Web developers often talk about, you know, your target should be something like 200 milliseconds. Now, my ping time from my home to the server is about 400 milliseconds. So I've already lost. Uh, it's impossible, all right. So in a, in, a, in a way, I've got a time budget for the processing step of nothing if I want to support people in South Africa or places with similar internet. So obviously I want it as fast as possible, but what's realistic? If I'm at 400 milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds will give me, get me to half a second in total from the user's perspective. Maybe that's okay, maybe you can share your experience later. But I'm going to be talking about this processing part, which is under my control, and this is the measurements from the server. Now, the horizontal axis is the percentiles. In other words, the 50 represents the median response time. So half of the responses, their time spent on the server is 88 milliseconds or less. Half of them are longer than that. So that is about the ballpark that I'm aiming for. That along with, you know, the network response time is maybe about as good as, I, as it can get. And obviously, there's a whole lot that's slightly faster, even as fast as 2 milliseconds. You can see the, the range I indicated there at the bottom. But obviously, we've got a massive problem here on the high end, up to 18 seconds for one query. Now, that's obviously an outlier, but you can see 5% of the queries are taking longer than a second. So this is in milliseconds. The 95th percentile means 95% of the queries are faster than 996 milliseconds, but it means 5% are slower than a second, just the part on the server. And of course, this cascade. So as long as, as soon as you've got a slow query, the other queries slow down because it's often because of I/O on the uh, on the disk. All right. So I wanted to set out to improve the performance on this. All right. So what does the query plan look like? This is. I thought I would put the whole query plan here, but it was entirely unreadable. It looks something like this, which scares me. So. I got a nice visualization uh, that I edited slightly. And you can see the color coding is trying to give a bit of an in indication of where it thinks is interesting. I didn't edit it, although I don't agree with everything that it indicates as interesting. But the exclusive time is the time taken by just that step alone, and the inclusive time is the time taken by that step and all of its children. Who here is entirely unfamiliar with query plans like these? Uh, everybody has an idea of what this means. Okay, that's great. Right, so the query starts here using the full text index. It gets 27,000 rows. I was looking up the English string internal server error, three words. It got 27,000 candidates. Then I do length filtering, throw away most of them. This is a function used for uh, implementing the full text searching. 
the details are not so important. Then I filter out based on the full text rank, in other words, the ones that share more than a threshold with a query. In other words, in this case, probably words sharing two of the three words, for example. Then I look up, then I join with the targets table, and then I sort by relevance. Now, the one I'm showing took almost three seconds, but this is on an entirely cold cache server. All right, so I did this query on a database that has not been used for weeks. So I expect everything to have been done, read from disk. Now, that's sort of academic. I mean, this is never going to happen in production, but it did provide some interesting insights in my opinion. <coughs> The full text query, you'll remember that index, the second from the bottom, was 50 megabytes. Pretty small, all right? It's going to read through that index very fast, gets 27,000 rows. But going through the sources table then to do the, the querying, even though that table was not that big, it was, I forget, 470 megabytes or something, it only needs to retrieve 27,000 rows to filter, took almost two seconds. All right, lots of I.O., quite a bit of processing. Not really, we're only checking lengths. It's not even a function call, I've got it in a column, but still, you can see, that's what took a lot of the time. And then uh, the join was 109 lookups against the targets table, that's the bottom row. Um, and obviously all of that's cold, and it's all over the place in a table that's two gigabytes in size, or two and a half gigabytes in size. So obviously it was jumping all over the place and doing these lookups uh, using an index scan. So the top rows really do nothing, the function scan took long probably just because it's never been used. That's always in memory because that's just a function. So what's taking time is reading the sources table specifically and then reading the targets table. The rest is uh, not that big. Um, the query plan I'm not going to show. There's just one interesting thing. It was on the previous slide, but here I'll just point it out that the row estimate for the step is entirely off. All right, so it's about se a factor of seven that the row estimate is off, which is often an indication of something going wrong with a query planner, right? It should have something fairly close, but it's very far off. Does that affect the query plan? I don't know, because I have not been able to fix that. I'll talk about what I tried in a moment. But just uh, to contrast, this is exactly the same thing with exactly the same schema and code, but with everything in memory. So I just reran the query again. Everything it needed is now in memory. 50 milliseconds, pretty fast, remembering that my median response time was something like 88. So this is probably, you know, in the, in the best half of performance. And then you can see that now the targets look up the last row very fast. All right, it's, you, we can ignore that part if it's in memory. But reading the sources table, which is basically these two rows, still taking up the majority of query time. Obviously, you'll see the number of rows and so on. It's all still exactly the same. It gives the same results. It's exactly the same query. So we've sort of got two main problems. Getting the information from the source tables is always slow. Even if the caches are hot, even if everything is in memory, it's taking up the bulk of the performance, uh, bulk of the time taken for the query. And the target rows are slow if they're not in RAM. Now we might say, get a lot of RAM. I hinted before, it's not a solution I could really consider because I'm on free hosting. But really, it's not that likely in my case because these things are all over the place. They're distributed over a large table. Someone is looking up a translation into Zulu for the word file. They're getting five suggestions, maybe 10 or whatever, and it's all over the place. Needs to go read probably you know, a, a disk page for each row. So it's going to be slow because maybe no one translated into Zulu for two weeks. It's not in memory. Um, and even if you later on translate something else, it's it needs to get other rows. All right. And they're all over the space, all over the table. Not a great thing. So let's get to things that didn't work. I talked about the row estimates being wrong. I tried increasing the statistics that's gathered for this table, doing the vacuum so that the query planner would have all of the information. It didn't work. It uh, ended up, I realized that gin indexes are not able to use table statistics uh, extensively or not properly. So even though it knows which are the common words in that column and which are the f rare ones, it always gives exactly the same row estimate regardless of what I'm querying for. So that seven times estimate is sometimes over, sometimes it's under. 
but it's always exactly the same. What was it, 3,000 and whatever rows? It always predicts exactly the same. It has no concept of the data distribution, and it can't use the length information either because it's only done in a later step in the query plan, or that's my understanding. I also tried to index on the sources table's length field, thinking it was a bitmap, uh, bitmap heap scan, so maybe it could combine the bitmaps of the two index queries and add them together, and, but it didn't work. I'm not sure why, actually, because that was my idea that it would work. But just so that you know, this, these things didn't seem to work. All right, that's a lot of technical background. I will pause there and take a slightly different route for a moment. <coughs> How do we determine if two pieces of text are similar? There are lots of ways. But this is now what we need to do in our application side, outside of the database. We're now getting these suggestions from Postgres. We got a query from the user, and we need to know which ones do, should we bother sending. We're not going to send 20 suggestions. No one's going to read that. We send two or five or whatever. We really want to limit it and send them the best ones. What is a good suggestion? Well, our, s our ranking is based on an algorithm called the Leffenstein distance. You can look it up. It's a well-known string comparison algorithm. Um, and really, it measures the number of insertions and deletions and substitutions required on, let's say, a character level to change from your query into the suggestion or the other way around. Um, based on the length of the longest of the two, we can convert that to a percentage. So whether we're talking about short strings or long strings, you can talk about 80% similarity or 90% similarity. And we configure the server with a threshold saying we're only going to show the user things of 70% similarity. So if you think at the start of my slides, I showed upload a file download a file, how similar is that on character level? That's maybe something like 75% overlapping characters. It also takes order into account. So it's not just about whether the characters occur, it actually takes the order of the sentence into account, so it's quite suitable for language data. It's also used in genetics, I've heard. Now, due to the way the Leffenstein algorithm works, if you've got a string of 100 characters and you're only looking for things that are 70% similar, you don't need to look at strings that are 20 characters long, because they're only going to be 20% similar maximum, maybe even less. So if we've configured our server for 70%, as we do at the moment, if I have a query of 100 characters, I'm only interested in strings from 70 to, I forget where, something like 140. I can ignore all of the rest, and that's why I have the length field, and that's why I filter for that later in the query plan, as you saw. So we do this length filtering not in the application, but in the database, obviously, so that we don't need to join unnecessary things with the targets that we are never going to use, and we don't need, need to rank them, etc. Why do I mention this? This is information that coming from the application domain that has ended up helping me to solve the performance problem. Now, I talked about cold caches. It sounds like something, initially I thought, there's nothing I can do about that, but it turns out that there is something I can do about it. For a translator submitting a query, or their tool submitting a query, saying they're translating this string now into Italian, that, user is, that query is only interested in the targets table with rows that are Italian. So the access pattern is knowable in a sense. It's clustered only in Italian rows. So it would have helped if all of those rows were together on the disk. Then I don't need to seek as much. Now, this Postgres server on our hosting provider as far as I know, is very old. I'm quite sure it's, it's not even a fast card disk drive. It's probably, so seek time is probably relevant. So this was my idea to try and find a way to get the targets sorted together or grouped together by language so that for a single query, the query will be limited in where the disk it would need to look for all of these rows that I said before are randomly scattered all over the table. That way, they're not that randomly scattered anymore. But the language usage is also clustered in time in a bigger sense, namely that a translator is not translating one sentence and then calling it a day. They're translating maybe all of the menus of a piece of software or the whole documentation or they're doing an update. And maybe there will be 100 queries over, the sen you know, over a half an hour or something like that. In other words, in the next half an hour, maybe I can count on a few things being cached. So it does make sense on sort of two grounds to have the targets table grouped by language. Now I talked about lengths, and this is a part that's maybe not that intuitive, but I saw, I, I mentioned that the source language strings, 
will have to be similar in length to the query. We're not interested in ones that are too short or too long. So we're going to group the sources, to, you know, limit the sources, but translations of long strings are long and translations of short strings are short. So I can do a similar thing in the targets table, but I don't know how long or how short, but the issue is I only want to improve the access pattern. So I'm going to, within a language, let's say within the Russian texts, just sort them by length on disk. So that when we're going to look for them, we know they're all going to be of a similar length because we've constrained it sort of through the join relation on the lengths of the source strings. And there's a high correlation if you actually calculate the correlation between the lengths of translations in between two languages. It's a very high correlation. I've done it once, something like 0.95 or 0.98 or whatever, I forget. All right, so by sorting them together by length, I limit the access pattern on disk to a certain area because they're all going to be somewhere hopefully fairly close to each other. How do you do that? I didn't know that. So you create an index that represents the order you want to sort it in. For the sources table, I'm going to try and do the same thing I, discovered, I discussed now for the targets table. It doesn't work. I'll say why in a moment. But this is simpler. So we sort by length. Remember, the sources table doesn't have language information. It's just monolingual. So I sort by length and afterwards alphabetically by text. Then for the targets table, it's the one I talked about more. I sort by language, then by the length of the text, and then alphabetically by the text itself. And then you call this command cluster the table using the index name. And afterwards, you can drop the index immediately if you want. So this takes a bit of time, but I don't care because I do all of this work offline. So I prepare the database offline at once a year or whatever. I update the database. It's read only for the rest of the time. So none of this processing happens on the server anyway. So this rewrites the table to be in the order specified by that index. And this way, even though nothing changed in a relational, relational sense or in a set theory sense, the actual pattern on the disk itself of the rows are now different, is now different. All right, so that solves the problem of the access pattern in the targets table. I do the same for the sources table, but it doesn't work. Why? When I use the full text search, I get suggestions of any row that has any word in common with my query. So if I search for internal server error, it has these three words. I'm going to find suggestions from the full text search for every row in the English table containing either the word internal or the word server or the word error or maybe multiple of them. And it's going to be all over the table in terms of lengths. So I sorted it by length. It's useless. It's a complete waste of time. I'm going to limit it by length only later in the next query step because I can't turn that around. Otherwise, I don't get to use the full text index. Then I have to cert, sh uh, do the filtering in memory, which is slower. So we have to use the full text index. It gives me results from all over the table. I don't have good access patterns on disk. And then we discard almost all of it due to length filtering, which feels like an awful waste. So what I did is I create a special index. It's again a gen index or generalized inverted index that's suitable for the full text index, but only for short strings. You say up to length 40. Now, due to the way the Levenstein distance works, I can't, I can't answer queries for strings that were 40 in length, only those up to 28. So you can do the calculation. I think it's 28 divided by 0.7 if it's 70% similarity. But for queries that are short enough, it will answer from this index, and the index didn't index that many rows, so it's going to give far less row candidates. Then the next step in the query plan will need to filter less rows, and I get a nice performance gain. That only solves the problem for short queries, though. So I define multiple of these. But I can't define the next one to start from 41 characters and up, because if I now query for 29 characters, or a string of length 29, then it would be interested in maybe suggestions up to length 42 or something like that, and then this index just won't work. So I need these partial indexes that overlap partially over the table. So I ended up with three. Right, so this is the same diagram as before, but you can see on the sources table I have those three. One that supports query up to length 28, one that supports queries from 29 to 93, and then one for all the longer ones, longer than 93. All right. Those three together are bigger than the original full text query because obviously I'm now indexing several of the rows multiple times. 
Um, but it ends up being a big win. Even if they're in cold caches, obviously now I've got a smaller index to go through, firstly, and I'm going to go through far fewer rows in the sources table, and the rest of the query is mostly the same. But there's another benefit, which is maybe a bit subtle, and that is that because if whichever of these indices I'm using, which any one of them I'm using, it's returning rows that are now localized in the sources table because I've I clustered by length. In other words, now I do get the benefit of that length clustering I did earlier in the sources table, even though the results are scattered all over the place. But the sources table is slightly smaller, so it's more likely to fit into RAM, and the sources table is used for every query, regardless of which language the translator is querying for, because it's always from English into some other language. All right, so this is exactly the same thing as before, the query plan. This is with hot caches, everything in memory. I don't have the, the production system with the database not in memory, so I can't have a similar one with cold caches, but I will give you an indication later of if it worked for cold queries as well. So this is with everything in memory. You can maybe keep in mind that before the query was 50 milliseconds. The total now, it's 18. All right, so that's about... 60% of the time that was eliminated. It's still the same hotspot, but it's substantially reduced and the join is actually now uh, also taking a bit of time. But the interesting thing is now, obviously, it's using now the new index. And instead of 27,000 rows, you can see it only uh, returned 10,000, which is uh, quite a nice reduction. Now, part of the number of rows that's returned has to do with the frequency of these words. If the query only had obscure words in them, the number of rows returned would be very few. But if people are translating common words, or a string with common words, they get a lot of rows from the full text index. And common words are common. So that the worst cases happen frequently, that's the problem. But that is now vastly improved. So this is the similar graph to before, the blue is what I showed before. Um, I'm lying, sorry, this is a benchmark. Sorry, this is to verify my approach before I deployed. So this is not the same machine, and I apologize, the graph is generated slightly differently. So the, the absolute times don't matter, but the blue is the benchmark on a sort of testing conditions, everything in RAM, one language only. And again, you can see the 50th percentile, so the median there on the left, and the absolute slowest query here on the right-hand side. The red, the middle graph, is the change just with a partially overlapping partial indices. And you can see that that's the major improvement for the faster queries. And it makes a massive difference also for the slowest ones. The yellow graph is for adding on top of that also the clustering, so the layout of the tables. For the fast queries, it doesn't make that much of a difference, probably because it didn't have to scan that many rows. Uh, but we can see that for the slow queries, even though everything is in RAM, Remember, everything is RAM, there's no disk I.O. with any of this. It's still vastly faster, and it, I guess that's because it is actually processing less disk pages, even though they're getting all from RAM, or buffers, as Postgres usually calls it. So on this benchmark, the median, average, and worst case times uh, were cut by 60%, so 40% of the previous times. Right, and this has now been in production for three odd weeks or something like that. Um, I took these stats uh, a few days ago. Maybe there would have been a few more by now to go by. The blue again is as before. That's the graph I showed earlier, and the red is the new performance. And you can see that it's even better than the benchmark suggested. And the way I account for that is that now cold queries, once where disk I.O. was required, is now included, and you can see a massive improvement. 95th percentile is a third of what it was before, for example. And thinking back to our goal of, let's say, more or less 100 milliseconds, we'd like to be faster than that. Whereas before, we only achieved that for about 55% of our queries. We're now reaching that for more than 80% of our queries. Okay, so I'm still interested in trying out the B3 GIN index. I implemented that, but that's only supported in a later version of the server I, I'm using. That way I'd be able to index the length along with a full text vector. It doesn't seem to help a lot, but on the longest uh, queries, 
just for that, because I have the three indexes, in the long one it does seem to help a little bit. So I'm ready to deploy that as soon as they upgrade my database server. For those of you familiar with uh, full text searching in Postgres, it has this configuration of stop words. The thing is, do you really want to index things like the words and, or, of, the, a, and, those things? Mostly not. For the short queries, maybe, because it's maybe only one of three words in the query, but for the long queries, almost definitely not. Now, I'm currently uh, using the default, which I, if I remember correctly, is to ignore the stop words, so they're not indexed, but for the short queries, I might want to add it, and I think I can afford it now. And then there are loads of improvements still possible on the application side. There are a few performance issues that are only showing now that the database side is eliminated. Um, and obviously some more features, but uh, maybe for a Postgres conference I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about those. I should have uh, submitted something for PyCon on Thursday. All right. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah, so uh, the index I'm using for clustering, I don't need for the application. So for deployment, it, uh, that's not useful for, for runtime. So I build the index only for clustering, and then I can drop it immediately afterwards because it's of no further use. So I don't want to push that to my deployment database. It's just taking up space. In other words, uh, so I think maybe the strange part is that I'm doing this all offline. Uh, I don't touch, you know, I do this on my own machine, I do this whenever I have some time, I generate the database and I do a dump after I've removed all of these unnecessary things. So I didn't mention that, but during import the schema is actually pretty different So to support things like checking for uniqueness of strings and a few other things. Then I drop some, tab some columns that I don't need and I change the indices to be optimized for lookup instead of for import. Um, and then one of those deployment steps is to do the clustering, creating an index for the order I want both of those tables to be clustered in, do the clustering and drop the index. Sorry, I'm not clear. You can... <laughs> okay, we can take it offline also if you want. Any other comments? Anybody else using full text searching, full text indexing? Your experience, good, positive, very good. Uh, trigram indices. Oh, you yeah. want to repeat your question? Uh, have you looked into using trigram indices? I think it's part of the B tree gen thing. Yeah, I, I have not. I have worked out the proof to try and determine uh, how I would need to use it so that I'm able to have some level of confidence that I'm not missing rows, you know, like which similarity sh should I use in the database to be able to comply with the similarity that I'm using in my application. Um, and I've lost that, that was years ago. So I think it would be possible. Um, but remember, this is a pretty big index. Uh, I forget how many rows in the English table, it was hundreds of thousands, which means that for a lot of trigrams, uh, the specificity of will be very low. Um, you know, so you will index something like THE a whole lot, um, which is not going to help much. Um, so indexing by words give you a little bit more bang for the buck, I think, um, and it uses stemming, so you can, even if you're querying for a plural of a word, you find the singular mostly. Uh, you know, Postgres has support for that, and like walking and walk and walks, you know, it it's indexes it at the same point. So I still want to investigate that. I'm not positive about its prospects, but I mean, it would be interesting to look into it. <laughs>
Thank you.